Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pineville First United Methodist Church, and welcome to the Path Contemporary Worship Service. My name is Thomas Bonner. I'm the worship leader over here in the Path. Again, just good morning to everyone. Everyone joining us sitting in this room, everyone with us in person here in the Family Life Center. I also want to say good morning and welcome to everyone joining us via our live stream. We're just very blessed and we're very thankful that we have the ability and the capability to reach you that way so that wherever you may be, wherever life is taking you, you can still come in and join us in worship. But church, we are all gathered together here. We're, we're going to do all kinds of things this morning. We're going to sing. We've got, uh, we got some announcements letting you know what's going on in the church. We're going to hear from Pastor Steve this morning. But just before we begin, I want to start this time by just blessing this time, this place, and all these worshiping wherever we may be with a word of prayer as, as we enter into a time of worship, a time of fellowship with each other, and a time of communion with our Father this morning. Father God, I do ask that you bless each one gathered in worship today, whether they are sitting in these chairs in this room, whether they are off somewhere else, but who, whoever is listening, whoever can hear my words right now, Father, I just ask that, that you bless them, that you bless this time, Lord, that we spend together. All of us, these, these adults, these kids, these parents, these students, there's, there's so much going on at this time of year and in life, so many things that pull us this way and that, but all of these have been faith, are faithful coming in worship and fellowship with one another and in fellowship with you, Father. So dear Lord, please just bless this time, bless these people. Give us voices so that we can raise them up and, and sing to you and pray together. Give us hearts and minds to to take in what you're going to give us through these songs, through the reading of your word, through the words that you've given to Pastor Steve. And then, Father, I just ask that you give us hands and feet to take it out of this place. It's my prayer every Sunday, but Holy Spirit, you are in this place moving. So, God, just make us present as you are already present here in this place where you say, where two or more are gathered in your name, you are there with them. So, Father God, just be with us this morning and make us ready to be here as your spirit is already moving among us. God, I love you. I pray all of this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. But church, I wouldn't invite you to stand this morning. We're going to start off with a time of song. We're going to start off with a time of praise and worship this morning. Thank you. 
Well, you know we got to talk about the Bible, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about a scripture. It's in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and it says, You say I have the right to do anything, but not everything is helpful. Hmm. That's some different words, huh? I, God's telling you that you have the right to do anything. You have a free will. You have the right to do anything, but not everything that you do is helpful. So let's think about trunk or treat tonight. Thomas said we have trunk or treat tonight. We have it today from 4 to 6 today. But tonight, trunk or treat, if you go home and have like this much candy, that's a lot of candy, huh? If you have this much candy, you could, it's yours. You could eat it all, right? Eat the whole bag of candy, right? You could. You have that choice, maybe. Well, but you should share. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. But what, more importantly, if you ate this whole bag of candy, what would it do? It would probably make you sick. It would hurt your stomach. It wouldn't be a good thing, right? Well, this is kind of what the Bible says. The Bible says you can choose to do that, but it might not be a good thing, right? It's yummy, but it might not be good for you. So, let's be honest. Candy's not good for you at all, is it? You're right, 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 right. Well, this big bag candy is a good reminder of that Bible verse where Paul teaches us that not everything that we can do is good for us. Paul's trying to say that just because you're allowed to do it doesn't mean that you should. So how do we know what's good for us? How do we know what is good for us? How do we know what we should do to stay right with God? We can think. What else can we do? Holding it right here. What else can we do? We can read our Bible. Bible. We can read our Bible to find out what's good for us. The Bible can make us help us make good choices, right? Like avoiding sin. Just like eating this whole bag of candy is not good for us. Sin's not good for us either, right? Right. So the Bible can help us make good choices. So guess what my challenge is this week? My challenge this week is to be smart, be wise. To read the Bible and ask God to help you make good choices. You think you can do that? That's a whole lot of things. You think you can do it all? I bet you can. Right. You're not be able to find it. <laughs> I'm sure we can find one for you. All right, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the good things that you've given us. But help us to remember that sometimes even the good things need to be used wisely. Help us use our resources wisely. And help us stay away from things that are not good for us. Help us to choose the good and right things always. Amen. Well, friends, as our children find their way back to their seats, I invite you to stand again with us as we... <laughs> That's okay. That's all right. At this time, I'd like to invite Trace to come up to lead us in the Apostles' Creed. Um, we have a few more weeks left of our Bible study, so we'll be doing this this week, and next week will be our last week of it. <laughs> As you're able, please stand. Let us join our voices together as we share in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The dirt and the rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For this he will not be blessed, but to me I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
voice is whipping. Once again, one more time, we've been, we join our voices together in song, we've joined them in, in praying, reciting the Apostles' Creed, but I invite you to join with me one more time as we pray the Lord's Prayer, that prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Thank you, man. I wanted to say one more thing about that video you saw, Irresistible. That is a class that we're teaching on witches, as Thomas said. Um, and we're kind of starting this out and kind of be in the gap between the one we just finished and the one we'll be getting for Advent coming up. So it'll be during the, maybe during the month of November, but also this coming Wednesday. So the sign up sheets are in the back there and we'll get books to you on Wednesday. So I invite you to come be a part of that. Well, we've been studying James, and the little book of James is a letter that was written to a number of churches. And these churches were scattered out. They had been persecuted. They were in Jerusalem to begin with as one church, and then when the persecution began there, the Christians, they were forced to scatter, but it was a good thing in a lot of ways because that planted churches uh, outside of Jerusalem and outside of Israel. So these were not Jewish-centered churches anymore, and so they're learning really what it is to be Christians outside of kind of a Jewish perspective. And so James is writing this book to them, this letter to them, really, we make it a book, it was a letter, just to tell them practically what that means, how to live the Christian life. And the, one of the first things he tells them is to be doers of the word, doers of the, in other words, Act on the Word of God in your life, and don't just hear about it. It's one thing for us to hear a great sermon or, or hear a great song and, and be moved by it, but what does that being moved by emotionally mean if it, if it has no bearing on our actions, on our values, on how we treat other people? And so James says, do not, not just hear it, but act on it. Otherwise, it's just nonsense to you if you're just hearing it and not acting on it. So that's the challenge, really, in the whole book. And then later on, he says, faith without works is dead. So faith has to impact our lives and how we act and how we view the world and how we treat other people and, and the things that we do in our lives to, to bring us closer to God through prayer and reading the Bible and, and studying and and witnessing and things like that. It has to act in our lives. Now, some would say, well, isn't that a contradiction of what Paul says? Because Paul said that we're saved by faith. Yes, saving faith is right. We're, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And Paul's right about that. But Paul would talk about the same thing too, but he used a different metaphor. He talked about like a tree having fruit. And he says, you know, if you're a Christian, people know, will know you by your fruit. We'll know you by the things that you produce in your life. Goodness, kindness, uh, uh, graciousness, uh, faith, uh, you know, witness, just the good things people see in you. So they're really saying the same thing. And then James goes on to talk about what we say, and he uses the tongue as a symbol for that. We all have those things in our mouths, and that's what makes us talk, so he uses the tongue for that. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, as we kind of make our way through this book. And if you're able to stand, please do so as we read God's Word. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers or sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. 
If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large, it takes strong winds to drive them. Yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts many great exploits. exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who made us in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessings and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring form or pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brother and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No one, uh, no more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and the way that it enlightens our lives. We pray, Father, that as we look at it today, that we will hear the words and apply them to our hearts. Lord, help us to realize that we have great potential each day. This morning we wake up, we can either be a blessing to people around us, be encouraging and loving and supportive, or Father, we can be a curse. We make that decision with everything that we say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. James is talking about one of the most difficult issues in our lives, certainly in my life. I know we all struggle with it. And he used the, the metaphor, the tongue. We still do that when we say something we don't mean to say. Uh, we call that a slip of the tongue, so we still kind of use that. But he talks about these three small, relatively small things that control much larger things. Uh, one is from the animal world. He talks about the bit. Now, the bit was, was created many, many years ago in the, uh, like 3500 B.C. to learn to control horses and allow us to to ride and to use horses in labor. And so the bit, if you've ever seen one, is just a small piece of bone or wood or later metal as they came around. This place in the gap in the horse's mouth between their molars and their incisors right there. And the bit was used to control a horse. This little small, only a few inches long uh, piece of tooling here controls a horse that can weigh between 500 and in the case of, of draft horses over 2,000 pounds with all of their power and weight and potential for destruction they're used for riding for working in, on the farms and help build civilizations why because just that little piece there in their mouths controls their actions helps us to to train them in order for them to be used. And so the same way, the, the, the tongue is just a small part of our bodies, and yet it can be used to curse people or it can be used to bless people. It can be used for vicious gossip or it can be used to enhance someone's life and build them up and help them. It can be used in hateful ways of prejudice and and, and vile saying, uh, saying vile things, or it can be used in order to build up people and bring them together, all from the small, relatively small part of our bodies. And so James is giving this as a warning and an, as an encouragement for us to take control of the things we say. Engage the heart and the mind with this tongue 
so that we don't say things that are destructive. And you've known people like that too, that talk a good game about being Bible-believing, God-fearing people, and yet if someone disagrees with them over their politics or their, their, their view of the world, uh, suddenly all of this stuff spews from them that is, that is hateful and divisive and polarizing. And so we have to be so careful. We've seen this in other people. Let us not see it in ourselves. We can spread vicious gossip. We can do a lot of harm. Children, hear this. Grandchildren, hear this. Those that we influence and those that we have care of, hear the words we say. And they begin to pick up the pattern for life that we give. We need to have the choice in our lives every day to make that difference in their lives. The second example he talks about is, is a rudder. And Paul knew a lot about, uh, or rather James knew probably a lot about uh, travel because uh, they were in different parts of the world now and probably close to water. And so they had the Sea of Galilee there as well. And so they knew about large ships being controlled by a relatively small part of that ship, the rudder. Someone had said, it's better not to own a boat, but to have a friend with a boat, okay? And uh, I experienced that in my own life when I lived in South Louisiana. I had two friends who had large, uh, relatively large sailboats out on Lake Pontchartrain. And from time to time, one of them would invite me to come and, and be a part of his crew, crew his boat with him. It's kind of hard to do that by yourself sometimes. So I would take advantage of that and go out on Lake Pontchartrain, really enjoy those days. So one day we were sailing across, and we were between Mandeville and New Orleans, and it was a beautiful day, kind of like today. We had a good wind, everything was just about perfect. But he had to get back, and so we, we turned the boat around. We came about, that's a sailing term. I learned that, okay? We came about and set the sail, and we started heading back toward the marina. We could see it in front of us. And so the sail was full, it was set, the rudder was set, we were heading back, and suddenly, we started just drifting. We were drifting to the side, and we readjusted the rudder, we adjusted the sail, we tried to, to stop drifting, but we continued to drift with the wind, and we kind of lost control of this, this boat, it was weird. So we finally kind of gave up, we dropped the sail, we uh, turned on the engine, cranked the engine, and we, we had to motor back in. That's not a great thing for a sailor to do, but we did, and we finally got in. It was some struggle even with the motor to get the boat back into the harbor and to get back to the, the dock. Well, when we got back, we were just puzzled as to what in the world had happened to that boat. And so my friend jumped in the water and started looking around the, the rudder. And sure enough, what had happened was we had snagged a crab trap somewhere along the way out in the middle of that uh, Lake Potch train. And so that crab trap attached to the rudder and snared with the rudder became the rudder of the boat. The rudder no longer controlled it. It was being controlled by that crab trap. And so that's just an example of how something as small as that could take control. And sometimes that happens in our lives. We get frustrated, we get angry, we get burned out, we get just fed up and things can happen in our lives that take control of our tongue, of our language, of our attitude, and we can express things that we don't mean to, and we can hurt our spouses, our loved ones, our children, our grandchildren with the things we say. And that's what James is warning about here, to, to engage the heart, engage the mind, make sure we are speaking words that reflect the faith and the love that we have in Jesus Christ at all times. The other example he gives, of course, is the spark. We are, thank the Lord, uh, saved from the big wildfires that they have out west, but we certainly read about and we see these on TV and in news reports, how they burn people out of their homes, how they cause all this destruction of millions of acres, and how they 
destroy lives as well. And so just about anything can set off a forest fire. Dry tinder and lightning are some of the things. Arson is sometimes, unfortunately, part of wildfires. I know the, the great fire they had in Pigeon Forge in, in Tennessee years ago was set by some teenagers who were playing around and caused great destruction. But I saw an ad recently about a safety ad, and it was about those chains that we use if we're pulling a trailer or a boat behind a vehicle, and how those chains need to, you need to make sure that they are secure, that they don't drag along the asphalt. Why? Well, they can create sparks. And even a tiny spark from a, a chain like that off the back of a vehicle can start a forest fire. So you have to be very careful about sparks. They, there was a famous fire in California uh, a couple of years ago that killed 85 people and destroyed over 500,000 acres of beautiful forest. How did it start? Well, they finally figured out how it started. There were some utility workers working in that forest. And one was pounding a metal stake using a sledgehammer, a metal strike, uh, sledgehammer. And as he struck that uh, stake, it created a spark. And just that one spark destroyed 500,000 acres and took 85 lives. And that's what Paul is talking about, I mean, James is talking about here with our language, with the words we speak. We're speaking gossip about someone, if we're speaking divisively about someone, if it's a situation here at church and we're, we're expounding upon that, we can, that little spark can destroy people's hearts, their faith, their reputations. We have to be so careful about what we say because that is what can destroy. And so, you know, one of the things in our, our Southern way of speaking is to say something negative about something, about someone, and then what do we say after that to make it okay? Bless your, bless their hearts. That doesn't make it okay, all right? That small spark, folks, can do great damage. That's what James is telling us here. So how many words do you speak every day? What are we talking about? Well, you spend about one-fifth of your life speaking, talking. Even if you're an introvert, you're doing that. So if you recorded all of those words each day, at the end of the day, you would have about a 50-page volume of everything you said yesterday, 50 pages. What would those pages say? What, was, what would be the, the content there? Would, would it reflect your life and your faith? If you extrapolate that out and you looked at a whole year of speaking, you would have 132 volumes of your words. And each of those volumes would contain about 200 pages. Do you know you talk that much? You do. That's a lot to rein in. That's a lot to take control of. And yet it is so much a part of our lives of faith. It is so much a part of our Christian witness. Many times you'll watch these talk shows and you'll have some politician or celebrity or musician who's written a new book. And you're so impressed. You go, wow. Where did that person who has, you know, the star of this or star of that or a politician who spends a lot of time in Washington or somewhere, where did they get the expertise to write a book, to organize their thoughts? They must have really worked hard on this. And maybe some of them do, but most of them do not, all right? Most of the people that you see that publish books that are famous use ghost writers. So a ghostwriter is uh, someone like David Fisher, who is a uh, ghostwriter and works for the New York Times. David Fisher's written over 70 books that none of them are credited to him. 
They're written by people like, written by people like Bill O'Reilly, uh, people like uh, William Shatner, people like Johnny Cochran, the lawyer. Uh, they're just like all these celebrities and famous people that are supposed to write these books actually have them written by David Fisher. So David Fisher has a whole basement full of old cassettes and tapes back when we used to do tapes and nowadays, you know, MP3 files and things like that, digital media, because these people just talk and they just keep talking. And then David Fisher is the one who organizes their thoughts, who writes the chapters and, and, and really writes the words that make them sound intelligent and like they really have expertise and, and puts it all down. So there are a lot of ghost writers like that. And sometimes you'll see as told to, you know, and they'll have the name of the person. But a lot of times they just, there's no obligation for them to credit the person who actually wrote the book. Now what if someone were following you around? What if someone were ghostwriting your story? What would it say? How would it start? What would be the content? What would be the content that they would write about your everyday language, about your everyday history, about your attitudes and your witness in our community? What would it say about you? I think I would want you know the, the best things about my life to be reflected. I would want the best things about my life and my attitudes for other people and my love and my concern for them. But I gotta admit, I'm not perfect either. So I'm sure my book would have some chapters I'd rather not have in there. Well, this kind of happened this week, actually. The transcribing part of my language and my life. So Diane and I were having lunch last week at a local place here. And I had set my cell phone as I many times do when I'm sitting there, just to get it out of my pocket, I put it on the table. And as we're talking and having lunch, I, I got a text from a friend of mine. And I, I didn't really pay much attention to it. I kind of looked at it and I put my phone back down. And so Diane later went to get an order to go to take home. And while she was gone, I, I looked back at my phone and I had this long, rambling text. Oh my goodness, I was paging through it. Was going, and I thought, has my friend gone crazy? Have they had a breakdown or something? To send me this page after page after page of this rambling conversation. What in the world? Am I going to have to do an intervention with my friend who's gone crazy? And then I realized, those are my words. Those are, those are the things I just talked to Diane about. And I realized that inadvertently I hit that little microphone icon on my phone. So it was recording and transcribing everything I said in that conversation. I didn't say anything bad in that conversation, but it was just a, a rambling thing. So what if that was happening in your life every day? What if your life like that, your words, your speech were being transcribed every day? What would that look like? Would it reflect your faith? Would it be the action of your faith in action, as Paul, uh, James says here, and not a dead faith that you just practice on Sunday morning? Would it show the love and, and grace of Jesus Christ in your life as you go about your daily life? What would that transcription look like? Christ has called us, and he says that every idle word that we speak will be accounted for on the judgment day. Well, that's kind of a scary thought. I'm glad we've got the grace of God to, you know, pour over all of that, okay? But still, Jesus is telling us also to be careful in what we say, be mindful of how we speak, engage your heart, engage your mind in what you say. Be careful about this divisive speech, polarizing speech, hateful and problematic speech in our lives. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we have your grace and forgiveness before us because many times we fail in this area. But Father, help us to grow in your life each day. 
Help us to grow and engage our hearts that are being transformed by you to the likeness of Christ, to connect with the speech and the words that we say each day. Father, we know that this goes beyond the walls of the church here. What we say here, this goes to where we, how we work and, and the where we work and where we go to school and what we say in our neighborhoods and in our conversation on cell phones and on social media and in text and in so many other ways. Lord, let us reflect your love and grace and forgiveness in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our band is going to play another song for us. And this is a time of commitment for you. And God has touched your heart today. Maybe there's some things you need to deal with in your life about how you use your language, how you use your speech every day, your conversations. Maybe you'd like to pray about that. These prayer rails are here for that. If you want to talk to me about any of this, I'll be standing here as well. Or maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I'd love to pray about that with you as well. So let us stand now as our band sings.
good to have you back from Cuba. Good to be back. How'd it go? I lost five or six pounds. Okay. Is that a good thing? Yes, good thing. Okay. Good to have you back. Let's be dismissed. Father, we thank you that you have loved us and saved us and have given us the great power that we have to be a witness for you, to bless, to lift up, to encourage, to be your people. Help us to do that by taming our tongue, by making us aware of your grace in our lives each day and everything we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you.